we were praying, we prayed this morning for Tuesday's election. If you haven't yet, um, please go out and vote. Please go out and vote. Super Tuesday, if you have not voted, please go out and vote. Make your voice heard. We live in an unbelievable time in the history of the world in which we live under a constitution that gives us the right as citizens to voice our opinions. You know how uncommon, is this thing on? I turned it from on to off. You know how uncommon it is in the history of the world for a people to have a choice in who governs them? It's, it's not a long held tradition. Over the millennia of human existence, you'll see that that wasn't the norm. So we live in an incredible time when we get to voice our opinions concerning our leaders. Go out and vote, please. Let's open in a word of prayer. I'll give a, I'll give a moment in silent prayer for each of us, the opportunity, give each of us the opportunity to go to the Lord in confession of sin if need be. If not, just to bring ourselves into focus here so we know what we're doing. So we're focused on taking in the Word of God, understanding another portion of what the Bible itself calls the mind of Jesus Christ. To push out the things of the world and to let enter the, uh, the things of God. So let's take a moment in silent prayer and I'll open us in prayer. Father, thank you again for an opportunity to come to a church, our church, the church of our choice, Gulf Coast Bible Church. Thank you for allowing us to have the Bible. It's a great responsibility. It's a great privilege to continue in, in the human realm to have this book available to us. We've got numerous Bibles in each of our houses. And that could change. I pray for the uh, courage of American Christians this week to go out and vote, Lord, to make a difference at the polling place. Uh, you've given us the right, you've given us the responsibility by Constitution to vote on our leaders, our representatives. So I pray that Christianity, that the churches would empty on Tuesday and go to the polls if they haven't already and vote, uh, vote biblical leaders into office. We desperately, very desperately need the American statesmen to rise up again. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this word. Thank you for, the, uh, for Exodus chapter 19, for the man that Moses was, as the scripture says, the most humble of all men that have ever lived, Moshe, Moses. So we thank you for the glimpse into his life uh, into his relationship with you. And as always, Lord, we thank you for the page after page of your revealing of your faithfulness, ever faithfulness, ever faithful, ever trustworthy, ever loving, ever caring. Thank you for revealing Love you, Lord, and serve you. Lift up the So we're in uh, Leviticus. Leviticus. We're in Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. 90 days, a quick backdrop. 90 days have gone by since Israel left Egypt. It says in the third month on the very day, so 90 days have gone by since Israel left Egypt. They're camped around the base of Mount Sinai. Uh, which we saw from the maps last time, was in the southern Sinai Peninsula, just uh, east of Egypt. I don't have the maps again, but you saw them last time. And God calls Moses. God calls Moses to go up the mountain, up Mount Sinai. Moses, come up onto Mount Sinai and meet with me. And there God makes a deal with Israel. He offers Israel a contract, a covenant. This is what it looked like quickly. 
This was Yahweh's proposal to Moses to give to the people Israel. And we're going to talk about the distinctions between what Moses was offered and what Abraham was offered, because I don't want you to mix those two things up. They're exceedingly different. One is unconditional and can never change no matter what man does, no matter what Israel does. The other is very, very conditional and depends entirely on what Israel does. The Moses covenant, the Moses contract, we call it the Mosaic covenant, was completely dependent on Israel's obedience. This is what Yahweh, what God, calls Moses up onto Mount Sinai to offer him, to offer the people Israel. This is the agreement we can enter into, Moses, you and your people. So Yahweh's proposal to Israel, if, if you will obey my words given through Moses. So this is what Moses brought down to all the people of Israel once he got it from God. But this is how God presented the offer in the book of Exodus. If you'll obey my words... And if you'll keep my covenant, what is the covenant? I'm about to tell you. In Exodus chapter 20, God gives the covenant, the Ten Commandments, the Levitical order for the priesthood and the worship of God, etc., etc. They haven't received the covenant yet, but he says, If you'll obey my words and keep my covenant, this is your part of the deal. And then God enters his part of the deal. I will exalt you in all the world. You shall be my possession, Israel. My people, out from all the other people of the earth, I will pick you as my distinct people, highly valued, highly treasured. Then you shall be my possession, highly valued and highly treasured people. Imagine that. Of all the people groups in all of the world, God says, I want to make a deal with you, you specifically, and I want you to be my representatives, my mediators to all the world. The other thing, you will be a kingdom of priests, a kingdom of priests who act as mediators between God and man in worship. He's going to exalt this people, Israel, if they would only obey His words and keep His covenant. What else is He going to do for them if they agree to the deal? He'll make them a holy nation. He'll set them apart, a morally pure and entirely set apart nation to the service of Yahweh. A nation of God's servants is who He wanted Israel to be. A distinct, set apart highly treasured, city-on-a-hill kind of people that all the Gentiles, us included, would look to Israel and say, what a relationship with Yahweh. What you have, I want. They were to draw the people of the world to Yahweh by their relationship with God. We want what you have. So the Mosaic Covenant, this agreement, if, if Israel would only agree to it and keep it, would give Israel an exalted position among all the nations of the world. So can you imagine God coming to us and saying, I can make you the greatest church in America. Everybody will look to your church as the example church, the pinnacle church. You'll walk with me. You'll talk with me. Everybody will have to come to your church so that the information will, be, will, will push out from you into the world. Of course Israel said yes. Creator God, the God of the plagues, the God of the Red Sea, etc., etc., the one true God came to them and said, I want to exalt you. And Israel said, great plan. Everything you say we'll do. The problem was they hadn't heard what God said yet. And once God unfolded the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law 613 rules or laws in all, uh, Israel would realize right away we underestimated our ability to sin. And we under we over us, uh, let's, let's say it this way, we overestimated our ability to be pure. We thought we could do whatever it is you wanted us to do. We overestimated our own human abilities. And once they heard the law, they understood that they had completely underestimated 
the holiness of this righteous God. Your law, your commands, your mandates are so high, we can't do it. As Joshua would later say, you won't do it, you can't do it. So, uh, the offer has been made though. Uh, I ask these questions concerning Israel. I tell you, the Mosaic offer, this thing that's written on the board here, if you'll obey, if you'll keep, then I'll exalt you, I'll make you a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Is Israel that today? The nation Israel, as you read about them in the news, are they exalted in all the world right now so that everybody looks to Israel as God's own people? Are they seen in reality the way things really are right now today in 2020? Are they seen as God's highly valued, treasured people? They had a choice to make. If, if, then, if you'll obey, if you'll keep, then these things will happen. Are they a kingdom of priests mediating between all the people in the world and Yahweh Himself? Is that what Israel 2020 is to the world? The answer to all of these is obviously no. Are they a morally pure nation set apart solely to the service of Yahweh God? The answer to that is no. I offer what they are instead today in 2020. This is the question. Or instead of what, what God's deal was with them in Mosaic Covenant, or are they living in rejection of Jesus Christ? Yes. Dispersed in discipline to the four corners of the earth? Yes. With enemies on all sides threatening to destroy her? Yes. That's the truth of Israel today. The rejection of Jesus Christ, not to get dispensational, overly dispensational, but the rejection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came, He came in the age of Israel. He was a Jew, dispensationally. If you can picture the chart, if you can't, I'm sorry, but if you can picture the chart, we have the age of Israel. It began when God called Abraham who was the first Jew, and it went on and it stopped at the cross of Jesus Christ temporarily because they rejected Jesus, the Jew, the Jewish Messiah. And the rejection of Christ caused the Jewish age to stop momentarily and our age, the church age, to begin where God the Father would call out a new bride for His Son, Jesus. So it's... It's, I say all that to say that the Mosaic Covenant is conditional. You have to do certain things, Israel, and then I will treat you a certain way. Conditional, conditioned on obedience. Uh, but again, this is entirely different from the Abrahamic Covenant. This is a covenant with Moses, a contract, if you will. We're going, to end, we're going to have, I give and you give, and we enter into contract. God also entered into contract with Abraham, but it was an entirely different kind of contract. 500 years earlier, now, now walk with me here, we're going to look at some slides. We have to review this because as we get into the Mosaic Law, listen to me, as we get into the Ten Commandments, I don't want you to misunderstand and to think that Israel had to keep the Ten Commandments in order to be saved from hell. Not true at all. In order to maintain their status as God's chosen people. Not true at all. In order to maintain the land of Canaan where God would, in order to maintain ownership of the land of Canaan, the promised land. That's not true at all. They didn't have to do anything in the Abrahamic covenant. So 500 years earlier, God cut a covenant with Abraham, the first Jew, that was unconditional. Israel didn't have to perform. There's no if word in the Abrahamic covenant. There is no if. The Abrahamic covenant, quickly, when you think of the Abrahamic covenant, I want you to think of three things. Land, seed, blessing. 
Every time you think of the Abrahamic covenant, there's a land portion, there's a seed portion, blessing portion. Land seed blessing. Abrahamic covenant, land seed blessing. Say it with me. Abrahamic covenant, land seed blessing. Say it again. Abrahamic covenant, land seed blessing. You got to you got to get this Old Testament information in your head. Land seed blessing. God promised Abraham and his descendants three things. What are they? Land seed blessing. Number one, let's just cover this quickly. It's review from many chapters ago, but I want to make certain that you understand the differences between the Abrahamic promises that God made Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, and the Mosaic covenant. One can never be changed. One, one changes every time or historically every time Israel as a nation would go in and out of disobedience. Abrahamic covenant does not change. So these are the things God promised Abraham. A piece of land. Land seed blessing. A piece of land that stretched from Egypt to Syria. One day this land will be Israel's forever, but not based on Israel's obedience. God promised Israel the land, and the land is eternally Israel's. They may not be in the land from time to time because of disobedience, but that doesn't mean God took the ownership of Israel, the land of, the land of Canaan, away from this people. He never took ownership away. They still to this day own the title deed to the, to the land that God called the land of promise, the land of Canaan. So he promised, us, promised them a piece of land only based on, on God's promise. Look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abram and he said to your descendant. Now listen to what, what's not in this statement. What word is, is mysteriously missing from this that is in the Mosaic covenant? In the Abrahamic promises, in the Abrahamic contract, it's all one-sided. I'm just going to do it. God says, I'm going to do this for you, period. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you become. We've looked at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We've looked at the 12 sons. We've seen sin after sin after sin after sin after sin. Even Abraham would almost immediately go to another king and say, she's not my wife. She's my sister. What are you so afraid of, Abraham? I just made promises to you. Sin after sin after sin. Disobedience. Untrust of God. But in the Abrahamic covenant, God just said, this I decree I will do, and that's all there is to it. So the Lord appeared to Abraham and he said, or to Abram before he became Abraham, the father of many nations. He said, the Lord did, to your descendants I will give this land. What word is missing? If. There's no if. There's no qualification for this. I decree to you, Abraham, this piece of earth is yours eternally. It'll never change. To your descendants, I will give this land. No if. What did Abraham do? He built an altar there to Yahweh who had appeared to him. Look at another chapter, Genesis 13, verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him. Remember the story, Abraham, his nephew Lot, they go up on a high hill. They're looking at the land. Abraham says, there's not enough land for both of us. We've got too many sheep, too many goats, etc. You pick first, Lot. I'll take whatever you don't want whatever you don't want. And Lot looks down and he sees the wonderfully watered areas of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot says, I want the water. Of course, he's got sheep. He chose right. He chose the water. God would have blessed him there if Sodom wasn't what, such a cesspool. A story for a different day. But after that event, Lot chooses his and Abraham says, okay, I'll take the rest. And God comes to Abraham, and it's very interesting because Lot had chosen an area. God says, no, forget all that. It's all yours, Abraham. The part of it does not belong to Lot. I'm giving it to you. So while he's up on this hill, he says, now lift up your eyes. God tells Abram, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are. Look north and south and eastward and westward for all the land which you see. I will give it to you and your descendants forever. Forget Lot. It's your land. It belongs to you and it belongs to the Jew. 
Very interesting. After this event with Lot, God overrules it and says, it's all yours. He can live in whatever portion y'all decide he lives in, but this is Jewish land. This land belongs to you and your descendants. And Lot was not one of those. A brother's son, not from the line of Abraham. So he gave him a piece of land. Again, there's no if here. What else would God give Abraham on this day or promise Abraham seed? Number two, the land is first and then the seed. What is seed? Zerah is the Hebrew word, Z-E-R-A. He says I'll, uh, a seed that would number as the dust of the earth or as the stars of the sky, an innumerable descent, number of descendants, uncountable number. There's going to be so many of them. Innumerable descendants that would survive throughout all human history and forever. This is just a promise. The Jews cannot be wiped off of the face of the earth. The Jews cannot be wiped off of the face of the earth, although madman after madman has tried. Why can't you eradicate the Jews from planet earth? Because God said... I will make your descendants innumerable and you will survive throughout all human history, no matter what Satan tries, and you will survive forever. Cannot be wiped off of the face of the earth. Genesis 13, verse 16, same chapter we were just in. Look at what he says concerning Abraham's descendants. He continues to make promise to Abraham without the word if. This isn't an if clause. This is a fact. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if anyone can number the dust of each particle of the dust of the earth, if anyone could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. And we know that we could never number the, the, the number of pieces of dust particles in the earth. Neither will the Jews be able to be numbered, God says to Abraham. I'll make your descendants as the dust of the earth. In Genesis 15, verse 5, we pick up this idea of the stars of the heaven. In a different conversation with Father Abraham, God says this. He took him outside and he said, Now look toward the heavens, Abraham, and count the stars if you're able to count them. Count them if you can. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. So we get the idea of the, of the dust of the earth, the stars of the sky, etc., etc. Innumerable people I'm going to make you. Just a fact. It's not the Mosaic covenant, it's not conditional. This is totally unconditional. Abraham doesn't have to do anything for these things to come true, Israel ha doesn't have to do anything to maintain these facts throughout all human history. These are simple facts. I'm going to give you this land. I've deeded it to you. And I'm going to make your seeds innumerable. And the third thing he says to the Jews, worldwide blessing. You're going to be a blessing. I'm going to bless you personally as a nation. And you're also going to be a blessing to the world. Worldwide blessing was promised to Israel without obligation on Israel's part. Again, when we see the verse, there's no if clause. It's just a statement of fact. I will make you a blessed nation and you will bless the world. Now, why could God say that so emphatically? What is the ultimate blessing to the world that Israel would give? That would come through the nation Israel? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And Israel had nothing to do with Jesus Christ coming on the, the scene. Israel's obedience or disobedience had nothing to do with bringing Messiah to the earth. Through Israel, all the world would be blessed whether Israel wanted it or not. Whether Israel was obedient or disobedient, God the Father in the fullness of time, according to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, would send forth His Son. So worldwide, an unconditional worldwide blessing was promised to Israel without obligation on Israel's part. Israel's blessings would reach outward to all the men of the world. 
And one day they will. Right now they're not. That's why I ask you the questions. Is this who they are? A treasured nation, according to the Mosaic Covenant. A treasured nation, a nation of priests, a, a holy nation set apart. No, that's not who they are. They disobeyed the Mosaic Covenant, which foretold, which foretold Messiah over and over. Do you believe that the Mosaic Covenant, what you know as the Ten Commandments, etc., foretold Jesus Christ? My question is, did Moses speak about Jesus Christ the Messiah? You think, where in the book did Moses speak about Messiah? I say all over it. We'll see some of those places as we go, but listen to this. In Jesus' own words, after his resurrection, Jesus says to people, to men, we can't tell the whole story, but this is what he says. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Jesus says, I'm all, I'm all over the law of Moses. These things are the things that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things much, must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses. So as we go through Exodus 19, 20, 21, 22, to try to think, where is Jesus Christ in this? Where is the word of, where is the, the prophecy of Messiah in Moses' law, well, Jesus says it's there. He says, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, etc., etc. And he says you can find that information in the Mosaic Law. Very interesting. We'll go looking for it in the following weeks. Worldwide blessing, ultimate blessing, of course, Jesus the Christ. So I said all that, we're done with that, but I said all that to, to make the statement that the, covenants, that the covenant that God is making with Moses in Exodus chapter 19, the Mosaic covenant is conditional. If you obey my words, if you keep my commandments, then I will exalt you as the highest nation. The opposite has to also be true. If you won't, then I won't. If you don't obey, then I won't, then I'm not obligated to keep my end of the deal. The Abrahamic promises that you see on the board, there is no deal. One way, Israel is God's people forever. They're promised a land, they're promised innumerable seed, and they're promised to be an international blessing. Those things will never change. You think, I don't, you, you may be thinking, I don't get it, because you said they're not in the land right now, uh, and they're not being blessed right now, that God has separated them. These two covenants fit together. But one is eternal and one is unconditional and one is conditional. Is Israel in the land right now? The, no, they're not. The nation Israel by and large is not in the land under God's blessing right now, but one day they will be. So just because it's not true right now doesn't mean that these promises to Abraham have been abrogated. They've not. They're still eternal promises to Abraham. God will decide when he brings them back into the land. I hear God saying, if you want me to exalt you in the world, Moses, I've already called you out as a unique people and promised you land, seed, and blessing. You are Israel forever. But if you want me to exalt you in the world as the most important nation to ever exist, then you must obey me and worship me properly. And thus I'm going to give you the laws on Mount Sinai that teach you how to obey me and teach you how to worship me properly. So Israel had the chance. Great statement. Listen to this. Israel had the chance to show the whole world how wonderful it could be 
to live under the government of God with God Himself as King. People are sending me texts. So Leanne Eldridge, um, she's fine. She's fine. She's only not in church today because she just recently flew in an airplane internationally. She flew back from Israel. So she didn't want to be with us last week or this morning because of the coronavirus and its 14-day incubation period. So uh, she's fine. She's back. She's home. Uh, but in, in protection of her church family, she didn't come to church today. So that's where she's at, and that's what she just texted me. I thought that'd be an interesting thing to say. So you could keep her in prayer. She feels fine. She has no effects of anything. She feels absolutely 100% healthy, but she doesn't want, because that virus has a 14-day incubation period, they say, she doesn't want to be a carrier of it and to give it to any one of us. So our sister Leanne, not with us. Again, Israel had the chance to show the whole world. This was their chance before God. Show the whole world how wonderful it could be to live under the government of God with God Himself as King. It was Israel's choice. Throughout, it was always Israel's choice. Oh, I didn't show these two verses, did I? Genesis 12, 2, concerning the blessing. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. That last part is a command. He's not simply making a statement, Abraham, you're going to be a blessing. He's saying, Abraham, go out and be a blessing in the world. It's, a, it's an in the imperative mood in the Hebrew. It's a command to Abraham to go be a blessing. The other verse is Genesis 22, 18. In your seed, Abraham, speaking to Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So they were to be a, an international blessing to the world. And as I said, ultimately the, the main blessing that we get from Israel is Jesus the Christ. In Joshua, concerning the fact that it was Israel's choice, Joshua 24, very familiar, very famous uh, refrigerator verse. At least the last part. This is what, in, in Mosaic Law, command number one, I am the Lord God, and you shall have no other gods before me, right? The covenant, the contract that they're about to have to make with God is you will worship me alone as the only God that's ever existed and ever will. They could or they couldn't. They had their choice. It was choice offered to them. And Joshua, the leader of Israel after Moses, makes it very clear that they had choice. You're free will agents. You can choose to follow Yahweh or not. Joshua tells the nation Israel that he's just led into the land of Canaan. If it's disagreeable, if you don't like it for whatever reason, if it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the, to serve the Lord or to serve Yahweh, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served, the false gods, the pagan gods... Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. So either go all the way back to Egypt, go all the way back into your past, and choose all the false gods that you know and through the ten plagues God destroyed, or the gods that are now in the land of Canaan, the god of the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hittite, the Hivite, etc., and then he says, but as for me and my house, I've made the decision. We're going to serve Yahweh. So you can either choose Israel, nation Israel, individual Israel. You can either choose to worship Yahweh, to live in a proper relationship with God through adherence to the Mosaic law, command number one, I am the Lord God, you shall have no other gods before me. Either live according to the Mosaic law in obedience or don't. Your call. But I've made my decision. My household has made our decision and we will serve Yahweh. Uh, I have to ask this question before we go on. Why enter contracts with man at all? Why would God take the time to enter into covenant with man? It's, it, it's, it's this 
eternal God of the universe putting himself in a position to be judged by man. You decide whether I'm trustworthy or not. You decide whether I keep my word or not. God's covenants with Israel, whether they were the, oh, the Abrahamic covenant we talked about that's unconditional, or whether they're the Mosaic covenant, which, which was conditional, would allow all the people to study God's actions throughout history. Now, God, you said if Israel would do this, and if Israel would do that, that you would exalt them. We want to know whether God's a trustworthy God. Does He keep His word? Is He someone when we come to the New Testament in Jesus Christ, we can believe when He said, all you have to do to to gain eternal life is believe in my Son, the, the Son whom I've sent. Is that true? Can we trust you? Or is there really something else we need to be doing also? Can you be taken at your word? And so God enters into these covenants with man so that we can evaluate Him as whether a trustworthy or an untrustworthy God. So he enters in the contract so we can decide whether or not he keeps his word. So all the world of humanity can decide for themselves whether God is trustworthy or not. He puts himself out on the line. Take the Abrahamic covenant, for instance. He says you'll have a seed as numerous as the seashore, the sand of the seashore, etc. If madmen had come along, like say Adolf Hitler, if Adolf Hitler were actually able to eradicate the Jews from the earth when he tried in the 1930s and 1940s, would God be a trustworthy God? Would it be a promise-keeping God if God allowed Israel to fade off of the planet? No, He wouldn't be. So we have these covenants that we read about in the Old Testament where we as Gentiles can look at this God and say, yes, there were times that Israel was obedient and you did exalt them to high status. Take the time when Solomon was the young king and a queen of Sheba came to meet Solomon. When, when Israel was exalted, when the king of Israel was exalted, and, every, and, and people from the worlds came to gain knowledge from Israel and from her relationship with God, with Yahweh, there were times when God kept His end of this bargain because Israel was in obedience to God. There were not very many, but that was Israel's faults, not God. So we get into Exodus 19. We're going to finish. we got 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes. Not many verses here. The Lord also said to Moses, again, not Abraham. These are conditional issues that God is saying to Moses and Israel. You you live a certain way, I'll, I'll exalt you. The Lord also said to Moses in Exodus 19.10, Go to the people and consecrate them. Today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments. We saw the word kadosh. Maybe we did, maybe we didn't. Kadosh, to be holy, to be made pure, and ready to stand in the presence of Yahweh. Go purify the people through certain things He's going to tell them to do. Uh, As we see in verse 11, it's a three-day process, this purification. Verse 11 says, And let them be ready for the third day. Continue this purification, this making holy, this kadosh action for three days. On the third day, Yahweh will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Listen to what God just said. On the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So all the people, Israel, this two million person horde that had gathered at Mount Sinai, the young, the old, male, female, all of them saw God's manifestation of Himself. They saw the fire. They saw the smoke. They felt the trembling of the earthquake, etc. Uh, From verse 9, last week we saw that all the people, both young and old, both male, male and female, would also hear the words of God. So not only did they see God's manifestation at Mount Sinai, they heard the voice of God from Mount Sinai as He gave the Ten Commandments. Now, I emphasize that because as a Christian for 20 years or so, 
I mean, 10, 15 years ago when I was a Christian for 20 years, whatever the math is, it's only been about 15 years that I realized Israel heard God that day. It wasn't just Moses. It wasn't God on Mount Sinai giving these Ten Commandments and all the rest of the law to Moses and Moses coming down and then teaching the people. That's not what the book says. The book says they saw the manifestations on Mount Sinai of God. He says himself, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people. And in verse 9, if you look at that, he says, all the people will hear. I will come to you in the thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak. And at the end of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, it's very clear. The people were trembling and they pled with Moses and they said, Listen, you go talk to God and whatever He tells you we will do, but don't let God talk to us anymore or we will die. So there's no question at the base of Mount Sinai, all Israel saw the manifestations of God, the fire, the smoke, etc., they heard the lightning, they heard His voice utter the Ten Commandments to them. Verse 12 says, Exodus 19, 12, You shall set bounds. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you, beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Why would you not be able to touch the mountain? Holy ground. When Moses was before the burning bush takeoff, your sandals, you're standing on holy ground. This is a place where God had chosen to come and meet with man, and no man except for those he personally invited were allowed to touch, even touch the base of Mount Sinai, or they would be put to death. Verse 12, for the person that touches... If anyone comes beyond the border, if anyone tries to climb the mountain, if anyone even touches the mountain, verse 13 says, no hand shall touch him. Don't even touch this abomination of a human being. But he shall be stoned or shot through. Kill him from a distance. This is serious. Whether beast or man, if it's, if it's one of your sheep that's get, that gets loose and goes under the boundary, kill that sheep with stones, he shall not live. And then he gives the next command here, the next order of events. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they, would, they take the horns, the, the uh, what do you call them? The horns. They take the horns, I was thinking antlers, but these aren't antlers, are they? They take the horn of the ram, of the ram and they make a, a, a shofar out of it. I've got a little bitty one, I should bring it and blow it. God would blow this ram's horn this day. There's no man that's blowing this horn. It's not Moses. It's not Aaron. They, they would simply hear it. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. Not up onto the mountain. Just approach the mountain's border. Nobody went up on the mountain that day except for Moses and Aaron. Verse 14, so Moses went down from the mountain. So Moses goes up the mountain, now he comes back down. He went back up again, now he's come back down. He'll do this three times in Exodus 19. Tired man. Moses went down from the mountain to the people, consecrated the people. Just like God had said, he began this kadosh, this making holy process. Moses went down to the people, consecrated, and they washed their garments. He said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. Consecration included these things, this, this making holy event, making yourself prepared to be in the presence of God Himself and to hear the words of God Himself included three things. Washing garments clean of earthly filth. Wash your garments. Wash your garments clean of earthly filth because the God they're meeting is not of this earth. So consecration included washing garments clean of earthly filth because the God they're meeting with is not of this earth. Earthly filth. Wash your garments. We could talk a lot about what this might signify. The fact of the matter is it doesn't say it signifies anything. So I'm not going to run down some rabbit trail and try to say now the garments represent. There's just no need for it. 
Number two, he says right here in verse 13, do not go near a woman. So the consecration also included not having sexual intercourse, which would make a person ritually unclean. Now this next phrase is important. It's not immoral. The sexual intercourse wouldn't make a person immoral. It would make them unclean to enter God's presence. We're talking about the difference between uh, ritual uncleanness and moral uncleanness or sin. There, this, this verse is not, is not in any way teaching that sexual intercourse is morally impure or sinful. That's not what this says. All it says is, in the three days between now and the moment you hear God's voice, do not engage in sexual intercourse because it will make you ritually unclean. Uh, not much more needs to be said. It's not a moral issue. It's a cleanliness issue before the Father, what He demanded to enter into His presence. And consecration also included not going up the mountain or even approaching its borders. We saw that. You come up this mountain, you even touch the border of it, you will die. In verse 16, God comes into sight of all the people. So it came about on the third day. Now this is the lead up to the Ten Commandments. Don't lose sight of that. All these events were moving now toward the mountain and God's about to give the Ten Commandments to Israel. It came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes. Imagine the scene if you're Israel. The mountain is going crazy, Mount Sinai. Not the valley, not the wilderness around it, but the mount itself. Thunder and lightning flashes, a thick cloud upon the mountain, and a very loud trumpet sound. Well, he said there'd be a trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Very interesting Hebrew word harad is the word trembled, H-A-R-A-D, and it means to be terrified, to be terrified, to be frightened, to be disturbed, or to be startled. When Israel was in the presence of God, they didn't say, oh, how wonderful God's here. What a blessed people we are. It scared them to death to be in the presence of Yahweh. And that's why it says, just listen to me, in Exodus chapter 20, after God speaks, now all the people witness the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, all the people witness the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled. They were terrified by it and they stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, Moses, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And listen to Moses' response concerning fear. And Moses said to the people, after in their hearing God gave them ten commands, Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear, this trembling that you feel now, this frightened state, this disturbed and startled state, that's a good thing before this God. See, people always try to translate fear in the Old Testament. Oh, it just means a reverential respect for God. It doesn't hear. It says they trembled when they were with him. And Moses says, God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. When you, when you think of sinning and remember the power of God in the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the smoking cauldron that this mountain became, think twice before you sin. Why did God let you see this, Israel? So that you'd think twice before you sin before this God. When they heard him and saw the first glimpses of what God would be this day on Mount Sinai, they trembled. 
There was thunder and lightning flashes, a thick cloud upon the mountain, a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God because the trumpet had sounded. God said, when you hear the ram's horn, come. So Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They stood at the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended. Imagine the scene of this. I wanted to put a picture up there, but I've never found a picture that could come close to doing this justice. You just have to let your own imagination envision it. Mount Sinai was all... Oh, So Moses brought the people out of the camp. They stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. So this whole mountain looked like a volcano with smoke pouring off of it and lightning. And I mean, the vision, the sound, the sight, uh, the brightness of it all. The, the, of course, a human being's going to tremble at this because the Lord had come down. He descended. The sound of the trumpet, or what does it say, uh, the whole mountain quaked violently. I mean, imagine that, being able to not only see it, but feel the tremors under your own feet. This is what being in the presence of God is like? No thanks. Moses, you go talk to God, and we'll do everything God says, but we do not want to be in the presence of God again. Why are you scared? So that next time you think about sinning, you'd remember this fear. That's what it says. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. You don't go on this mountain unless you're invited. He invites his, his man, Moses. The Lord said to Moses, Go down. So goodness, can you imagine? I've, I've done this two times already, and now you're asking me to go down again off the mountain, but of course he does. So as soon as he gets up there, God says, you need to go back down. You need to warn the people so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze. And many of them perish. So don't get closer trying to see what Moses is seeing. That'll cause your death. And also, he says in verse 22, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, kadosh again, make themselves holy, or else the Lord will break out against them and kill them is the implication. Uh, these are probably the firstborn sons of Israel, those that, that God spared in Egypt. There is no priesthood yet. Aaron has not been made the high priest yet. That comes in the Mosaic law. So who are these priests? Maybe the firstborn sons of Israel acting as priests. We're not told. That's my guess. Moses said to the Lord, listen to Moses' response. God, God tells Moses, you need to go down there and warn the people not to come close. And Moses kind of scratches his head at that one. And Moses says, the people, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai because you warned us. Why would the people dare do this? You've already said that they couldn't. The humility of Moses, almost the naivete of Moses, of his people, these people that he was leading, it's a very interesting statement. Moses says the to God, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Uh, I just hear Moses saying, you already told us this once. Why would anyone disobey you? Why would any man of Israel or woman be tempted to come close to Mount Sinai? You've already said they can't. It's a very interesting statement. I don't know why it's in there. Uh, just a very interesting statement, this, this thought that Moses had. Lord, why would anyone disobey you? Why would I have to go down and rewarn them? They've already been told they'll be stoned if they touch the mountain. Anyway, there it is. Verse 24, Then the Lord said to him, Go down and come up again. So before the Ten Commandments are uttered, Moses is going to be up on the top of the mountain again. But God tells him, go down and warn the people again, and then turn around and come back up. This time he adds, brother Aaron, the Lord said to him, go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord or he, the Lord, will break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. 
What we're not told here is that Moses went back up the mountain, but obviously he did because that's what God commanded him. Go down and then turn around and come back up again. It ends here, so Moses went down to the people and he told them. So he again goes down to warn Israel not to come too close to this smoking, trembling, lightning-filled mountain. And I'm sure the people said, no problem. Not gonna, we're, we're not getting anywhere near there. They were trembling as we saw Harad. They were trembling in the presence of Yahweh. I want to go over this very quickly. Uh, I don't want to beat this up, but I want to say this about the Mosaic Law before we start reading the law next week. The Mosaic Law... Forgive me for this. My wife yells at me when I apologize. I make no apologies. The Mosaic Law is ordered after a suzerain vassal treaty. In the ancient Near East, all I'm trying to tell you is, in the ancient Near East, historically, you know I'm a historian, the Mosaic Law was ordered after something that people already knew. Uh, the people on the earth, the, the suzerain is the king. Forget the big word if you don't like it. Forget it. Call him the king. The king would, and this is what I'm trying to tell you, listen to me. The king would enter into contract with his subjects. Simple as that. The king would enter into contract with the people that he ruled over. If you'll do this, I'll do this. And that's exactly what the Mosaic law is ordered after. There's a preamble in verse 3. There's five points here and we're done. There's a preamble. Tell the sons of Israel, hear ye, hear ye. Great language like this. Tell the sons of Israel, you have a preamble. Then there's a historical prologue. And remember in verse 4 of chapter 19, God says, You've seen what I've done to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings, etc. So he gives them a bit of their history. This is what I have done for you so far, and now let's enter into agreement. Then the third thing, there's a statement of general principles. The general principles concerning how the king and the people that the king rules are to get along with each other. This is the suzerain vassal contract. The suzerain being the king, the vassal being the subject or the people that he rules. There's a statement of general principles in verse 5a. If you obey my voice and if you'll keep my mandates, these are the principles of the contract we're entering. Then there's consequences of obedience. If you'll do what I say, then you will be my own possession, you'll be a kingdom of priests, you'll be a holy nation. The only reason I bring up this title, Suzerain Vassal, is because there were kings and people that they ruled in this day in human history that entered into contracts that were under this form, this guideline, this uh, um, outline. So the people would have, been, would have understood this outline of how kings ruled their people. So God wants to be the king, and He's making contract based on this suzerain vassal treaty outline. The consequences of obedience in 5b and 6a, to be my own possession, a kingdom of a priest, a holy nation. And the last one, the consequences of disobedience. We don't have here the consequences of disobedience. Uh, but if you'll write down Deuteronomy chapter 28, 29, and 30, that's where you'll see the disobedience. Blessings for obedience, cursings from disobedience. Let me read some. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all His commandments and His statutes, which I command you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. There are consequences to disobedience in this treaty. Cursed you shall be in the city, and cursed you shall be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Wait a minute, I thought you wanted to make me an exalted nation. Yes, I do. But if you disobey, these are the consequences of disobedience. 
Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. I'm going to knock, uh, I'm going to knock fertility out of your people. Not only your, your wives won't have babies, your animals won't reproduce. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body. Cursed shall be you when you come in. Cursed shall be when you go out. We're talking about warfare there. And that's all I can do because it, uh, it's depressing. But in, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, as part of number four, the consequences of obedience. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, dot, 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 Blessed you shall be in the city, and blessed you shall be in the country. See, just the opposite. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flocks. You'll be numerous in people. Fertility will be the order of the day for Israel. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl, multiple or abundant food. Blessed shall be you when you come in. Blessed shall you be, you be when you go out. In war, I'll give you uh, victory. The Lord will cause your enemies to rise against you, who rise against you to be defeated before your face, etc. So here's the choice. Deuteronomy 28, the first part, do everything great, will live peaceably, and all the world will see how wonderful it is to be governed by Yahweh God. Live disobediently, Israel. And the second part of Deuteronomy 28 and 29 and 30 will be your reality. Again, Joshua says, it's your call. Choose this day whom you will serve, either the gods of your fathers on the other side of the river or the gods on this side of the river, the gods of the Amorite, the Canaanite, etc. All these pagan non-gods. But as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the time you've given us to look into your word this morning. Please make these things clear to us as we continue to think through them in the hours and days and weeks to come. Uh, just not so that we would know history, Lord, but that we would know that you make contract with your people so then we could, then we could watch your people and see how faithful they are, and then we can see your responses to them. Do you ever change your mind because of the disobedience of man? Does... Uh, uh, is there a time when Israel gets so negative, so hateful to you that you would say, you know what, I'm out. And we see through the, through the pages of history that you never do turn your back on Israel. You're a faithful, you're a trustworthy God. So when we read the words, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, we can absolutely affirm that to be true. We believe and we're saved eternally. Thank you for the confidence that you've built in us our confidence in you through the pages of the Old Testament. We love you, Lord. We serve you. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen.